Hello and welcome to Bonding One. This is Ionic Covalent and Metallic Bonding. Uh, to introduce bonding, I want to talk in general about all bonding types. Um, the attractive force between electrons and nuclei uh, of nearby atoms or ions is a bond. Um, how the electrons interact uh, between the nuclei of that bond is what makes it a certain type of bond. Um, for future reference, ionic covalent metallic bonding are, um, for lack of a better word, intramolecular force. In other words, in, in between the atoms of a molecule. Um, we know that ionic compounds don't make molecules nor do metals, but um, we're talking about the forces that make this fundamental unit of matter um, of a compound whatever it is. And so um, we'll look at it as electrostatic force between ions and an ionic compound, uh, between uh, atoms and a covalent compound, and uh, in a different way, the interaction between atoms and uh, metals. Atoms bind for two simple reasons. Number one, to reduce potential energies within the atom. Number two, to increase stability of the molecule or whatever structure it is. Ionic compounds are the type I want to talk about first. I want to reflect a little bit on that first slide real fast, just to kind of note these values for energies. Uh, the energy between the bonds of each type, that's very important, and we'll come back to it um, on a couple of slides in the future. But for reference now, kind of peruse the strength, the relative strength of those three bonds, the energy required to break them is what that value is. Ionic compounds are the first type I want to talk about. Um, Ionic compounds, we know this form when uh, a cation loses electrons, atom, and then another atom gains electrons, becomes an anion. Um, and we know that those can consist of metals, nonmetals, polyatomic ions. Um, but the feature is a cation and an anion. Uh, there's no charge in the compound. They're held together by strong electrostatic forces that can require up to 4,000 4, kilojoules of energy to break. Have very high melting points. We call the fundamental particle the formula unit. And this is a particular, um, I think it's sodium sulfate or something similar. Uh, but the, the fundamental unit of the of the um, ionic compound being the formula unit is the lowest whole number ratio. So it would be like Na2SO4 uh, on that particular slide. Um, no bond is perfectly ionic. There's always some degree of sharing in any bond. Um, at room temperature, uh, all ionic compounds form a crystal lattice with repeating geometric 3D configurations. Um, though they are stronger in some than metallic or even covalent bonds, uh, ionic bonds can't move. Um, so they're rigid and they break apart easily. So really strong bonds, but since they are rigid, they snap and break and they're brittle. That's why we see these crystals that we can snap apart. Ionic compounds can also be hygroscopic, where they absorb water from the air, and that's where we get hydrates from. Um, we've done a lab with copper two sulfate, where we know that it's a, a pentahydrate molecule, um, and what it amounts to is that that the structure is attractive to water molecules in the air and binds them in a certain proportion with the crystal. Uh, some ionic compounds are so uh, willing to pull in water from the air that we call them deliquescent, um, meaning that they will form, uh, take on so much water that we see them form droplets in little solutions uh, under relatively normal relative humidity values. Um, most ionic compounds are soluble in water. Um, they are electrolytes when they are soluble in water. Um, if they dissolve, they form ions. Um, forming ions is what allows them to be electrolytes to conduct electric current, both in the solution form and aqueous solutions, but also when they're molten, not in solid form, though. We have a couple neat little models there you can peruse. Ionic compounds, this is a trivia slide, but I always like to, to talk about this a bit because people get curious about transition metals, how they form ionic compounds, which electrons are they using. Um, and this just gives a little, a, an idea. Um, essentially what happens to trans transition metals is they form a pseudo-noble gas electron configuration. Uh, what that means is that they lose uh, enough electrons um, to at least stay half full in the D subshell or completely full. Um, other than that, they look a lot like a noble gas. So zinc has got a plus two charge. It loses its two electrons in the 4S sublevel to look like this. Um, iron, two loses uh, electrons to take on a 4S1, 3D5 configuration. And then iron, three 
there's just three electrons that take on just the 3D5 configuration. And we know that half-filled and um, completely filled subshells in the D subshell tend to form more stable um, constructs. So valent compounds are different. Uh, we know that they're formed from sharing electrons and bonds. Fundamental particle, we call the molecule. And this is, as you don't know this, this is sugar, this is a fatty acid, and these are gases. So we have solid liquid gas here. We'll preview of this slide. So you see covalent compounds can be solid, liquid, or gas at room temperature. Uh, most of them we find are liquids and gases, but there are many that are solids. Um, in a sample of pure substance of covalent compound, the different molecules are held together by weak intermolecular, intermolecular forces, IMFs. Um, we'll cover that in another time. Um, but what we notice is it's not like an ionic compound where you have this, this repeating crystal pattern. We just have a molecule that, inter, that relates to uh, its neighbors because of forces between the two molecules. Covalent compounds exist as molecules, though some can ionize partially or completely. The one we think of first is acids, which is coming soon. Polar covalent compounds are soluble in water. Think of sugar when you think of that. Nonpolar compounds are insoluble in water. And there's a reason I put a picture of a Glade uh, push-up style air freshener here. Melting point and boiling point in covalent compounds is low. They vaporize easily. Uh, we would say they have a high vapor pressure at room temperature. That's what makes this, this car freshener work. And it's what makes the Glade um, uh, pop-up smell the way it smells. Is because the molecules that are that make that are made of um, fairly easily liberate themselves from neighboring molecules and vaporize into the air. Now that's because of the weak intermolecular forces that hold them together. A little bit more on electrolytes. We said that electrolytes are formed when compounds form ions in solution. Um, the, the specific term we'll use is dissociation. Dissociation means that the, the sodium chloride in this example forms ions in solution. Uh, what's not shown here is water molecules between them. This is different than we see with polar covalent molecules that don't form ions but are charged. And with um, solutions that have even greater charge, you may see a tiny bit of electrolytic uh, function to something that forms ions in the water like uh, acetic acid, which is vinegar, and other weak acids. But typically what you need to have a strong electrolyte is something that completely forms ions in solution. Um, weak electrolytes may form a few ions, but not a whole lot. Non-electrolytes like sugar or ethanol don't conduct electricity at all by themselves. So this is just a close-up picture of the difference between dissolved salt and sugar, an electrolyte versus a non-electrolyte. Deciding whether or not something is ionic or electric or ionic or covalent is um, not really a black line. It's kind of a gray area. Uh, but we determine whether a compound is considered ionic or covalent by its polarity. Um, we'll calculate a, a value for polarity across a single bond by subtracting the electronegativity of each atom. Um, and then we know that electronegativity is the degree to which an atom pulls on an electron in a bond. So this is the table that we're used to um, from uh, our experiences so far. But we have one similar to this that we can examine the electronegativity value for each atom on the periodic table. And then we can calculate the difference across a bond. Generally speaking, when electronegativity difference is greater than 1.7, we consider it to be ionic compound or ions form where the difference is between 0.4 and 1.7, we call it a polar covalent molecule, where the electron density would be greater on the more electronegative atom. And then we have uh, less than 0.4, we call nonpolar, where there's roughly equal sharing of the electron, electrons across the molecule. I like this graphic because it doesn't draw any lines, um, and it talks about percent ion ionic character on this axis, and the difference in electronegativities on this axis. And so you see there's a transition. So calling something absolutely ionic or covalent at this point is a little bit silly. But we can say that above this point, something has a high degree of ionic character and thus behaves like an ionic compound, probably forming ions in solution. Okay, but again, this is not a perfect line. Um, the values will help us though and make our determinations of what we consider the bonds to be. So real quick, rubidium fluoride, let's look at that. We have 0 0.82. I need to pick up a different pen, bear with. <laughs> 
So 0 0.82 is rubidium, and fluorine is 3.98. Subtract the two, you get 3.16. That's greater than 1.7, so we'll call that ionic. Carbon and oxygen, we have 3.44, and we have 2.55. So we should have, let's see, 0.45, 0 0.99, 0 0.899. Check your math, with math, Mr. Crump. This is a polar covalent bond. Nitrogen and nitrogen would have a difference of zero, so that's going to be nonpolar covalent. This, my, this is my own little note to self to abbreviate. Tin and chlorine, 1.96 for tin. Chlorine, 3.16. So we get 1.5, so this is certainly a polar covalent. Sorry. It's not, it's not greater than 1.7, so it's considered polar covalent. Now you might say, this is a metal that's a nonmetal. This should be ionic. It's an ionic compound. But the bonding style, by our definition, would be polar covalent because the difference in electronegativity is not greater than 1.7. Though, with 1.5 in the presence of a metal, we can understand that it would have a high degree of ionic character for a, a covalently bond com uh, compound, bonded compound. So, when drawing a polar bond, we have a couple of conventions for how we can represent the polarity. Um, um, whenever we have a polar compound, where one side's got m more electron density than the other side of the uh, molecule, we call that uh, dipole. In other words, it has a positive pole and a negative pole. In the, the example hydrogen and chlorine and hydrochloric acid, we have a difference of electro ne electronegativity that's uh, about, about 1.5, roughly. Um, so it's a polar covalent molecule. And since chlorine's more electronegative, we would draw this symbol. This is a delta, a lowercase delta symbol, uh, a Greek delta, and this is... Um, the positive end and the negative end. And so if we're drawing the Lewis structure, it would look like this, where the electrons are more around chlorine than hydrogen. You can just kind of imagine that this electron came from hydrogen and this from chlorine. The other convention is an arrow with a positive on one end and an arrowhead on the other pointed towards the direction of greater electronegativity. And it just this is how I draw them, just like that. The plus where the positive side is, the arrow where the negative side is. Um, this electron density map is very revealing where red shows the higher concentration of electrons over time blue lower concentration shows that we have a greater electron density around the chlorine part of that molecule so but both these conventions will be used by you metallic bonding um, is essentially the way we refer to metals as they form uh, large structures I'm calling it bonding is kind of a misnomer but it, it works for our purpose um, essentially what you have in a metal any kind of metal you'll have um, you'll have centers where the nuclei and core electrons are located throughout this, the structure. Um, the nuclei and core electrons are attracted to the electrons that are around. And what ends up happening is the electrons that are in the valence shell for these metals essentially get lost to the entire area around because they're mutually attracted to the atom they're on as they are the atom nearby. And so whatever forces abound, those electrons are, are basically able to move as they free, see fit within that sample of the metal. Sometimes it's referred to as a sea of electrons, but don't fall in love with the term. Think about it in three dimensions, and think about what that means for those electrons. The nuclei are repelled by each other, but attracted to the electrons. And so what you essentially have is the electrons acting as an insulator between the nuclei that both keep them at a certain distance from each other and keep them very close together, and most importantly, able to move across each other. And this is what gives metals the wonderful properties they have. So... We'll say that these valence electrons have been delocalized from the core electrons and nuclei and travel freely. Um, and this is what I said earlier about the insulation. The metals are essentially able to move and slide across each other, unlike an ionic compound, which would cleave and crack when given pressure. Metals can reform and take different shapes. So what we'll see in, in micro, uh, microscopically is that metals take on crystals much like the 3D crystals of an ionic compound. Um, in, in a metal, we could, we'll call it a unit cell, just like we would in an ionic compound. Um, but that's where the different sort of ends, because that shape is able to change. Um, a, the first couple physical properties I want to talk about of metals are electrical and thermal conduction. Um, the, the freedom of the electrons within that molecule allows them to conduct heat and conduct uh, electricity easily. Um, metals are able to be pressed into wire, that's called ductility, 
hammered into shapes. That's malleability. And that comes from the ability of the atoms uh, to slide across one another while insulated by all the electrons. Additional uh, properties given by that are boiling point, luster, melting point, strength, opacity, and many, many others. An alloy is a mixture of metals uh, where metals are going to be dispersed in some distribution and in some uh, uh, very percentages depending on the type of metal and its application. Uh, some examples you may have heard of, steel, gold, uh, white gold, sterling silver, brass, stainless steel, bronze, 14 karat gold, and there, the list goes on and on and on. Every form of structural steel there is um, carries its own specific recipe of metals that it's made from. Um, and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of metal alloys just of steel, uh, just of steel and um, uh, iron. Um, it's important to understand that alloys are made two ways. Uh, the first is a substitutional alloy, where the atoms that are interspersed are relatively the same size. Okay, and this is brass, tin, pewter, where the metals are, you know, very similar. Another type of alloy is an interstitial alloy, where instead of putting similar size atoms, we put small atoms that are able to um, uh, bolster the strength of the metal. And this is um, uh, in structural steel. They'll put carbon as an interstitial alloy in order to strengthen the metal by filling the gaps between the atoms. Um, and it's often referred to as high carbon steel. Uh, there's other techniques to making these alloys too, but these are two large scale primary uh, ways that alloys are made. This concludes bonding one bond types. You should have taken high quality notes. Please rewatch this video as you need and see us in class with questions.